I have been asked to tell you how I came to write and issue the Emancipation Proclamation that became effective on January 1st, 1863 to free the slaves in the Confederate States. I have to say that after two years of civil war, now in 1862, there had been a tremendous loss of American lives and no significant changes in sight. It was on the morning of July 13th, 1862, that I was taking a carriage ride with Bill Seward and Gideon Wells to the funeral of the son of my secretary of war, Edward Stanton. I started a conversation with my two cabinet members about a subject that I had given much thought to ever since I had taken the oath of office. I always hated slavery. I claimed it in 1858. I hated it because of the monstrous injustices of slavery itself. It deprived our Republican example as a guiding influence in the world, and our enemies could taunt us as hypocrites while our real friends of freedom would doubt our sincerity. I went on to say that I had given the subject of slavery much thought, and I had come to the conclusion that as a military necessity to save the Union, we must free the slaves. Bill Seward interrupted me to say that to do that involved consequences so vast and momentous that we should consider this very maturely and cautiously. All right, I did, but I started writing anyway. So why did I wait until the fall of 1862 to use the right legal means to do it? Time. It was the right time. I could not wait for the legislative option, nor wait for the northern public opinion to decide. They had remained largely hostile to the idea. All right, the decision was made. As the story goes, and you know I like to tell stories, I called the cabinet meeting on July 22nd for a free discussion, not on whether to issue the order or not, or for advice, but to give suggestions on the technicalities of just doing it. As from previous experience with this group, I should have known what was going to happen, like the wrangling we had in April 1861, when the Confederates started bombing Fort Sumter. After reading the draft, it seemed to begin with Salmon Chase, my Secretary of Treasury, who was quick to say that such a universal decree would set off pandemonium across the Confederacy, resulting in depredation and massacre, and the rebels would go screaming to Europe for foreign intervention to prevent a race war. He said, I would approve the proclamation if you permitted the generals to arm the slaves when they were able and saw fit, but it was better than no action at all. Then Edward Bates, the attorney general, said, I would welcome the proclamation, but only on the condition of deporting all African Americans from the country. It would be forced expulsion. I am fully convinced that the two races cannot live and thrive in social proximity. Montgomery Blair my able postmaster general, who arrived late in the meeting, was quick to denounce, This proclamation is a license for freed black refugees to flood the northern labor markets. I advocate rather to support gradual compensated emancipation and link it to colonization, as it is sure to cause an outcry among conservative party members and Democrats, and the Republicans would lose the fall elections. Then he added his most important objection. It would put in jeopardy the patriotic elements in the border states, and they would likely run scared and secede immediately from the Union. Three of these gentlemen remained silent during the meeting. Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, Caleb Smith, Secretary of the Interior, and Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War. I had to find out later whether they were in favor or opposed. Gideon Wells was opposed for several reasons. He felt that, 
The proclamation involved unpredictable results, a revolution of the social, civil, and industrial habits and conditions of society in all the slave states. Rather shortening the war, I was convinced it would generate such a desperation on the part of slave owners and would intensify the struggle. Also, I question your extreme exercise of war powers. Secretary of War, Mr. Stanton, on the other hand, immediately grasped the military value of the proclamation. There would be tremendous advantage to be gained if the massive slave workforce could be transferred from the Confederacy to the Union. He was a real believer in the justice of it all. Now, as to the other silent cabinet member, Caleb Smith, Secretary of the Interior, he told his assistant behind my back that if I issued the proclamation, he would resign and go home and attack the administration which he did, and accepted another job in his home state of Indiana. The most important voice and last to be heard was that of Bill Seward, Secretary of State, who said, I would approve the decree, but on one condition. It was not about the terms, but about the timing. I feel strongly that it may be viewed as the last measure of an exhausted government, a cry for help from an administration that lacks the power to win the war. Wouldn't it be better to postpone the proclamation until you could give it to the country supported by military success? I hadn't thought of that, and so I did and then waited. Then the day came, Monday, September 22nd, after a battle which I suspect will set a world's record for the most number of American lives lost in a single day. September 17th at Antietam. Around 26,000, near the same number of casualties on both sides. In any case, I told the cabinet at the beginning of the meeting that emancipation had been suspended, but never lost sight of. I had said nothing to anyone before that. I had made a promise to myself and to my maker to free the slaves if the Almighty would give us a major victory. The rebel army was now driven out, and I was going to fulfill that promise. I said, conceding that this might seem strange to say, God had decided this question in favor of the slaves. The idea of making policy on the basis of a communication from heaven was foreign to me. He was satisfied it was right and was confirmed and strengthened in his action by the vow I made and the results of the recent battle. Well, now that you know how all of this has to do with my relationship with my maker, I'll give you a bit of the proclamation itself, just as I gave it to my cabinet boys on September 22nd, 1862. It starts like this. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will... Now I take leave for you to remember the proclamation, and that I was firm in my decision to make right for all of the centuries of men and women in chains and the blood drawn from the whip and the lash. I believe that it is the central act of my administration and the greatest event of the nineteenth century. The name connected with the act will never be forgotten. God bless you.